Chapter Five of the Yellow Sheet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Yellow Sheet, the LibriVox Nano Rimo Project, 2007. Chapter Five, written and recorded by Sibella Denton. Corey lifted his hands from his keyboard to grab double hands full of his shaggy brown hair. Cradling his head in his hands, he groaned a groan of intense dissatisfaction with his efforts. "'Damn it all, anyway,' he thought. Nothing was going well in any of his novels today. His characters kept doing the strangest things, and he couldn't seem to control them. First Chuck had set off an atom bomb, then Derek had parachuted off a cliff. Corey smiled to himself at the thought of telling his two roommates what they got up to in his novels. Then Jennifer and Alice, two of his closest friends, kept appearing in all his story incarnations, whether he wanted them to or not. He'd tried writing a new story set in Japan, but Liz had shown up. Oh, Liz! Everybody knew he was completely in love with her, except, of course, her. She was tall, five foot ten in her stocking feet, and had gorgeous blonde hair cascading in waves down her back, and hazel eyes. Even when he changed her physical details in the story, her adventurous attitude and intelligence came through in at least half of his female characters. Corey heard a key at the kitchen door, the main one they all used. Not knowing who it was, Derek, his girlfriend Jennifer, her girlfriend Alice, or their other roommate, red-haired Chuck, he decided to stop writing for the night. He was in the living room at his laptop, and dexterously he closed the document and opened his favorite Dungeons & Dragons scenario website. He was dungeon master that night, and he had not done nearly enough planning since he had been writing all day. His character was a druid, of course. He loved to play other scenarios. Nevertheless, his games were pretty popular among the crowd, so they often asked him to play dungeon master. He loved playing God and creating the scenarios. When they were all gathered round the table, Corey, wearing his green velvet hooded cloak and the lion-headed amulet he'd gotten from eBay, a number of rolls of the polyhedral dice got the game under way. Everyone was drinking, well, everyone except Liz, because she wasn't staying over. Not that Corey'd have minded sleeping on the couch and giving Liz his bed, but she wouldn't hear of it. She never would, damn it. "'Hey, let's go to the fair tomorrow,' Derek exclaimed. "'I know we weren't planning on it, but it's only a three-hour drive, and the weather is going to be great.' Jennifer, at that moment, sitting in Alice's lap, slid out and sat down in her seat next to Derek. Playfully, she leaned over and lightly thumped his arm. It's four hours if it's one, and I have to work on my term paper. At least I should, and Alice has to work. Me too, said Chuck. Have to work, I mean. I don't. You, Liz? asked Corey. Nope. I say let's do it, she answered, addressing the whole table. Further discussion had led to the game wrapping up very early, at only about 11 p.m. Corey, Derek, and Liz were going to the North Carolina Renaissance Festival, which everybody called fair, and as the gates opened at 10.30, they were going to leave about 7. Liz was driving, and Liz drove like a maniac, driving way too fast in the sports car her parents had bought her as a college graduation present a few months before. Corey worked in a bank, Derek worked at the sportsplex, and Liz was working in their old college's admissions office. Alice and Jennifer were working on their senior year, and Chuck, who'd graduated, was a manager at the local bookstore. Still, retail meant working weekend hours, and Chuck usually worked at least one day of the weekend. Early the next morning they were off. Derek napped in the back seat. Corey occupied the front bucket seat next to Liz, his favorite place in the world, and he and Liz sang all the pub songs they could remember all the way up to Charlotte. They got there in a little under four hours, and the gate show was already over when they finished dressing. Liz looked, in Corey's eyes, a goddess in her Renaissance court garb of Elizabeth I era, and Derek was wearing his favorite pirate attire. Corey, in deference to Liz, was wearing his court garb as well, and Liz looked approvingly at him. The two hundred dollar doublet and poofy pants were worth it for that look. She took his arm, his chest swelled proudly, he felt it so that other people must see it, and they entered the gates of the fair. Their first stop was the Tortuga Twins show, which was just getting under way. Then Derek took off after a girl they knew, the black-haired, black-eyed Maggie the Rose Seller. She wasn't selling roses at the Carolina Fair, but she did at the fair back home in Georgia. Corey and Liz exchanged a knowing look. 
"'Polyamory must be fun if you can mentally handle it,' he murmured. Liz arched one eyebrow. "'Not for me, though. Me neither, but it seems to work for Derek and Jen.' "'Yeah. Hey, I'd like a glass of mead. Let's get one,' Liz said, pointing to a drink-stand across from the back of the Tortuga Twins' stage. They wandered after that, had lunch, steak on a steak, and one of those huge smoked turkey legs for Corey, and a chicken sandwich for Liz, and Liz decided to have another cup of mead. She rarely drank, and as Corey wasn't drinking, she decided to get a little bit drunk at the Ren Fair. "'Corey, you'll drive home, won't you, sweetie?' she asked, leaning toward him, her cleavage mesmerizing to him who loved her, her goblet full of her third cup of mead artfully displayed by her crooked right arm. What could he do? He was completely in love with this woman, and here she was, asking him a simple favor. He'd have given her anything in his power. Of course, he said, and she leaned up just a little to kiss his cheek. Then they went to watch the human chess match. Held in the jousting ring on a huge roll-out chess mat, audience members were invited to play characters in the match. Little children were selected as pawns, people in costume for king and queen, Liz and Corey, the best dressed in the crowd, were selected as black king and queen. Other attendees played other pieces. Liz was laughing and flushed as she asked Corey to escort her over to get another cup of mead. He complied, and then they returned to the jousting ring. Derek was there, Maggie was there, and the jousting was about to begin. Corey was fingering his amulet, the one he wore for fair and D&D, &D, and recalling that the eBay seller had called it medieval or renaissance, and wishing he knew more about it. It was certainly very, very old, and made of bronze. Corey liked to believe it was worn by a real druid in time immemorial, and dated far back beyond 1400 or so, as the seller had dated it. Maggie had been selected as one of the Green King's favorites, and the whole crowd seemed to enjoy the jousting, despite its being scripted. Derek and Maggie went to have some lunch, as they'd not eaten, and Corey and Liz strolled along the fair. In the corner, near the jousting arena, Liz turned to Corey and lifted one arm to play with his amulet. Her eyes didn't meet his, and it was all Corey could do not to pull her full against himself. He put a hand out to steady her and settled it on her waist. "'Why haven't you ever asked me out, Corey?' she asked in a light-hearted tone. He answered in kind. "'You want me to ask you out? I see you nearly every day.' "'No,' she said in a soft whisper that didn't seem to belong to her. "'I mean, seriously.' Corey hardly knew what to say. "'Well, you were dating John when we met, and—' "'John and I broke up almost a year ago,' she broke in. "'But you—but, uh, you've—' He broke off and started over. "'We're friends.' "'Yeah, but that's not enough for me any longer,' Liz said, in that small whisper, her eyes finally meeting his. Corey saw there a desire and a longing to match his own. He didn't need to think any longer, and he dropped his leather mug to the ground and dropped his head to kiss her. He pulled her closer as his body cried out for more. He was vaguely aware of the disappointment of kissing her while she was wearing so many heavy clothes, but that was almost instantly drowned out by the thought that he was kissing Liz. Her mouth opened with a soft groan as she invited him to kiss her more fully. Moving his hands across her back, he urged her ever closer. "'Damned hoop-skirt,' she said, laughing, breaking away from his kiss. "'I guess that's my answer. Alice said you liked me, but—but but John did a number on you, and—yeah.' Sunday morning saw Liz run into Jennifer in the hallway. With a faint blush and a grin, she confirmed Jen's wide-eyed glance at Corey's door. Liz slipped back inside, noting that Corey's amulet was on the floor. She put it over her head and let Corey's robe drop to the floor. He opened an eye to look at her. You're beautiful. I'm fat. You're not. You're curvy. Girls today think they have to be skinny as a so-called supermodel. Do you really think a guy wants to sleep with a girl like that? It'd be like fucking a bag of antlers. Liz laughed and threw herself back into his bed and his arms. Somewhere in Japan, a tall blonde woman in a red parka was speeding away in a yellow van with a small woman called E. Somewhere, an Elizabeth McKenna was lying in a hospital. Some Derek was wafting on a nuclear breeze to the bottom of a chasm. And on top of Corey's wallet, on his nightstand, was an envelope with no return address and a Eureka, California postmark. He'd gotten it in the mail that day, but hadn't yet opened it. In that envelope was a piece of paper of the same type that a physics professor had looked at only just then. 
It was a yellow sheet of legal note paper, and it contained the very same words. We know. The amulet around Liz's neck warmed, but she didn't notice. End of chapter 5